time to talk about liars. Defamation, slander, and libel all encompass a deceptively simple area of law. Now, this video is going to dive deep into the law. We're going to dive deep into some examples. And the very end of the video will cover the damages that you might be entitled to if you successfully pursue a defamation claim. Now, this video primarily focuses on workplace defamation in the state of California. However, defamation is relatively ubiquitous from state to state. So even if you're not in California, and even if your situation isn't a workplace situation, this video will still be educational. But as always, contact a lawyer in your state for specific legal advice. Do not rely on this video for legal advice. That would be stupid. <laughs> okay, from a layperson's perspective, defamation uh, generally just means that there's a lie being told. And if you're the victim, the lie is being told about you. Now, as you can imagine, the law is far more specific than what we just typically think of defamation. So let's cover some basics. First of all, slander and libel are just different types of defamation. Defamation is the umbrella term for this area of law. So before we get into the specifics of what slander and libel are, let's first really get an idea of what defamation is according to California law. Defamation typically consists of five different elements, which we'll define more here in a minute, but let's just go through them. Ah. Number one, the bad guy made the defamatory statement, the false statement, to at least one other person, meaning he or she didn't just say the mean thing or the false thing to the victim, they actually published it to somebody else. Two, the statement was a false statement of fact, not opinion. This is super important. Again, we're gonna talk more about that in just a second. Three, the hearer of the statement must understand what it means and who it's about, i.e. the victim. Four, it has to cause damage to plaintiff's reputation. Now, some of these damages are usually assumed, but not always. And five, and this is important, that the damage that the employee is complaining about was actually caused, causation, by the false statement of fact and not by something else. Come on! And I thought, I Libel, being the written form of defamation, obviously would require those five elements we just discussed, but California Civil Code Section 45 gives us some additional insight. It says that the false statement of fact, I mean the defamatory statement, must expose plaintiff to hatred, contempt, ridicule, or obloquy? I have no idea how to say that. Obloquy or causes plaintiff to be shunned or avoided, or has a tendency to injure the plaintiff, remember we're talking about the employee usually, in his or her occupation. Obviously, that last subsection applies a lot in employment cases. Slander, being the spoken or verbal form of defamation, also requires those five elements under the general defamation category that we discussed a minute ago. But California Civil Code Section 46 now gives us some additional insight as well. It says, uh, slander charges plaintiff with a crime, loathsome disease, impotence, or want of chastity, or tends directly to injure him or her in his or her occupation. So the verbal false statement of fact must do one of those things. All right, let's try to make some sense of all this lawyer gobbledygook. Let's first figure out this fact versus opinion thing. Remember, defamation requires a false statement of fact, not opinion. So what's the difference? Well, you and I both know the difference between a fact and an opinion. But the court really refines that by saying that a fact is something that you can prove true or false, whereas an opinion is something that's far more subjective, that you can't prove true or false. Okay, so let's figure this out with an example. Say for an example, your supervisor put in your performance evalu evaluation, which led to your termination, that you were a poor performer. Um, I'm pretty sure that any court in California would hold poor performer to be an opinion and not a fact. So you would lose that defamation case like 100 times out of 100. On the other hand, let's say the supervisor put in an email, uh, we're gonna terminate John Smith, i.e. you, because he embezzled $100,000 or he misquoted a bid by $100,000. 
Now that is a fact, that's a statement of fact that you should be able to prove true or false with documentation and eyewitness testimony. Okay? Now, I will say it's very, very rare that you would be able to win based on something that is said in a performance evaluation about you because courts almost automatically hold anything said in a performance evaluation to be an opinion. So be careful if that's the foundation of your case. Remember earlier when I said that the false statement has to be communicated or published to a third person? This is the publication requirement and here's what it means. All this element requires is that the false thing being said about you is communicated to a third person. It cannot just be said to you by the bad guy. It has to be communicated to somebody else. Now, this can be done verbally or in writing. It can be done to one person. It, it can be done to 500 people. All the element requires is that the lie being told about you is told to somebody else. If you're the owner of a company or you're the manager or in HR, you might be curious, well, hey, wait a minute. Can the company be liable for a defamatory statement made by a supervisor or an employee uh, underneath? Well, the answer is yes. The company can be vicariously liable for the actions of employees or supervisors if those actions were done in the course and scope of their employment. So if the employee is on the clock or doing job duties when they make the defamatory statement, likely the employer would be liable. On the other hand, if the defamatory statement is made when uh, the dude's at the bar with his buddies and it has nothing to do with work, the answer is probably not. Uh, it's, it's not a rush or anything, right? To really understand defamation, you need to understand the defenses against it. And in the context of employment law, there's really only two. Number one is truth, right? The cheesy saying goes that the truth will set you free. Well, in defamation, that's totally true, right? Defamation requires a false statement of fact. So if the employer shows that the statement was in fact true, your defamation case is totally toast. Number two, and this is where most employment defamation cases go to die, and that's called privilege. The term privilege is super confusing to non-lawyers, so let me make it simple. A privilege is a right to do something without legal consequence. Okay, so in the context of defamation, the employer has a privilege. And that privilege says that employers can say false things about employees. So long as it's being said without malice, and it's being communicated to people who have a common interest in the subject matter of that communication. Okay, so there's two main components of this privilege. Without malice, and it's communicated to somebody who has a common interest in the subject matter of that information. So let's unpack both of those now. In order for an employee victim to show that this privilege does not apply, you have to show that the false statement of fact was made with malice. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, the court has identified one of two elements. Uh, either one, you show that the bad guy just absolutely hated you, had ill will towards you. Um, that's just difficult to do, uh, but possible. Or two, you have to show that the bad guy lacked all reasonable grounds to believe that the publication was true and therefore acted in reckless disregard to the employee's rights. So you have to show basically that the person either hated your guts, which isn't easy to do unless you've got great evidence, or two, uh, that the bad guy was just a total buffoon with respect to the truth. Also, pretty difficult to show in a court of law. The best way to explain the common interest portion of the privilege is to use an example. There was a case where a truck driver was fired for falsifying his time cards and driving log. Uh, then the employer told all the other employees that's why the guy was fired. So he sued for defamation, and then the court threw out the case based on this privilege. And the reason why it threw it out is it because it said that the employer and the other employees had a common interest in knowing why uh, and, and discussing the reasons for termination if you falsify your time records. Uh, based on that example, you can use your imagination to see how courts um, or judges can liberally apply this privilege to basically encompass almost any type of communication. So that's why I said earlier that this is where a lot of defamation claims go to die. What about the situation where you're looking for a job and you apply to a company 
and then they ask your old company for information and then the old company gives false information and thereby the new company doesn't hire you. Can you sue them for defamation? Yes, but it's really well established that the privilege applies in those situations. So you likely wouldn't win a defamation claim. However, the California Labor Code, section 1050, outlines some pretty gnarly stuff against employers if they make misrepresentations to prospective employers. And it includes triple damages. So don't do it, employers. Just reveal the dates of employment and move on. Don't say anything negative about your former employees. Let's quickly talk about the statute of limitations. As you probably know, every lawsuit has a time limit. If you don't file within that time limit, poof, you lose your right to that lawsuit. Uh, defamation claims in California have a one-year statute of limitations. So as soon as you find out about the defamatory statement made about you, call a lawyer. Don't wait 365 days before you call a lawyer. That's stupid. If you're the victim of defamation, what kind of damages can you get in a lawsuit? Well, every case is different. So the amount that you will get depends on a variety of factors that is impossible to predict without knowing about your individual case. It all depends upon the judge, the jury, the lawyers, the facts of the case, and the behavior of the bad guy. But the types of remedies that you're available to, well, there's four. Number one are your lost wages. In most employment cases in defamation, you either lost a job because of defamatory statements or you didn't get hired because of a defamatory statement. In both those scenarios, you don't get wages because you're out of work and those add up. Number two are punitive damages. Now, these are rare and it depends upon how good your case is and how good your lawyer is. But basically, these are exemplary damages meant to punish the bad guys for such bad behavior. The third type of damage are pain and suffering damages. These are the anguish, the emotional duress that people go through as a result of the bad behavior. And while the general public thinks that that's kind of silly, these damages are very, very real. And if you've been a victim, a serious victim, not one of these people looking just to try to make a couple thousand dollars, but a serious victim of defamation or these other employment harms, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And finally, you can get interest and cost back of pursuing the case. So that's the general gist of defamation. I hope you found this video helpful. If you need a lawyer and you're in California, don't be afraid to give my office a call. There's a lot of other good employment lawyers in the state of California. Um, but don't sit on your rights. Contact a lawyer uh, as soon as you can. All right. Take care. I'm tired of talking.